Vacation time is upon us. What time is that? Well, of course, any time, right? And so some of you may be thinking of taking a vacation in the car with your dog. So I thought I would share with you what things I think you need to consider as far as traveling with your dog. So let's get into it. Hi, I'm Susan Garrett. Today, I'm going to talk about your plan how to prepare your dog and what to consider on your trip. The plan needs to involve like how much time do you have? How long do you want to stay away? And if you're traveling with your dog, you want to make all parts of it enjoyable for the dog. So let's say you're planning to go vacation someplace that's a 15 or 20 hour drive away. You don't want to say, well, let's get in the car and let's drive eight hours one day and seven hours the other and let's get there. If you've got a dog or dogs in the car, consider their experience over that two day trip. You want to break it up as much as you can. So plan to not travel as much as you may have if you were by yourself, plan to add in at least two hours into every day, an hour of for lunch and two 30 minute stops somewhere in the morning or in the afternoon. That way your dog's going to look forward to getting into the car. Every time you say, let's load up the next day of traveling. If you make this an unpleasurable experience, you're going to find your dogs are going to start getting resistant about getting in the car with you. So the plan could be, where do you want to go? Where, and what do you want to do when you get there? I would strongly encourage not to think about theme park vacations when you're traveling with the dog. Yes, most of them would have a kenneling area you can leave your dogs at for the day, but really is that a fun vacation for your dog? If the days are going to be filled with you going out for 12 hours sightseeing, maybe your dog vacation isn't the right one for this time around. Dog vacations mean this is going to be a fun time for you. It's not just like, I don't want to pay for a pet sitter. So you're coming pal right? So dog vacation, let's make it something that will be memorable for you. I remember when I took my dog on that vacation, it was so much fun. Okay. So for your plan, your, that's your travel plan, where you're going to stay and what you're going to do when you get there. All right. Now let's talk preparing. There are things that I strongly encourage you to do with your dog to prepare them for this trip. First of all, how's your dog going to be traveling? Will they be traveling in a crate or will you have to use a seatbelt? Now, my first preference always is to put your dog in a crate. I personally love traveling with my dogs in a gunner crate, but I recognize those are big crates for a lot of people's cars. So there are other crates that are suitable, like the rough, tough crates. There are another great crates. Plus you can get those in pretty colors, but you might have a small car, Susan. I don't have room to pack my stuff and have a crate for my dog. Okay. So there are a couple of seat belts that I would recommend. They do crash tests on seat belts. There's a safety testing center for dogs. I love the safety and security of my dogs being in a crate. Bottom line, we want our dogs to be safe, but we want them to be comfortable. Please just don't go to a big box store and take a, a harness off the shelf because they say it is safe. Do your due diligence and make sure you are getting one that your dog will be safe in the event you do have a little bit of a fender better. Okay. So we've made the decision. If you've said, yes, I will be creating my dog when I travel, let's warm up some crate games. So start playing crate games regularly with your dog and start creating your dog during the day. Now that may be something you're already doing. Maybe you create your dog at night, but if your dogs are like my dogs, once they're adult, I don't put them in the crate that often. So I would prepare by putting them say two hours a day, they're going to stay in their crate, which prepares them for the length of time that they're going to have to be in a crate when we're traveling. So number one, crating, get your dog used to being crated more. If you are going to be staying in a hotel or a place you're going to use a soft sided crate, then you want to make sure you build up and understand that your dog's not going to destroy that soft sided crate because it happens a lot. So test out at the soft sided crate and make sure your dog is comfortable and won't try to rip their way out of that soft sided crate. Next thing I would recommend is start playing games. Now, if you are a member of our recallers program, make a list of the recaller games that you're going to do when you are on the road with your dog or when you're on vacation to make it an enriching and engaging experience for them. So we've got our dog created. We've got some games that we know that we can play next. It's your choice. So very important. You're going out to a strange area. You might be walking your dog at a park. You don't know. You want to play it's your choice and grow it's your choice to include surprise things found in the grass. I know of three people personally who, when they're out hiking or they're at a park, their dog ate a stash of marijuana. So 
if your dog has really good, it's your choice, they may alert you to, uh, look what's here, mom, but they're not going to devour it. All right. So put in a few rounds of it's your choice in your enriching games that you're playing with your dog. Of course, you're going to want to make sure that your dog doesn't get car sick in the car. So take them on some short little day trips around the city right now. And here is my final preparation. And you are going to thank me for this one. Make sure your dog will pee and poop on a leash. Yeah, you're welcome. Because otherwise you're going to be one of those people walking up and down that little strip of grass outside of a hotel going, come on, buddy, please go to the bathroom. But if your dog is used to only doing their business out in your yard or out on a, a walk in the forest, they're not going to want to do it on leash. So level one, number one would be get them to be comfortable going to the bathroom on leash. Level number two would be put it on cue. So I have both elements on cue. So if I want my dog to pee, I say, go potty. And if I would like them to poop because I think they're due and I want to put them in the car for a couple hour drive, then my cue that I use is get busy. Now, it's not the cue that makes it happening, guys. It is the conditioning. So that is the preparation for the dog. Also, if you've never done any enrichment games with your dog, I would do it beforehand so it's not something new and novel. So puppy puzzle games or putting things in stuff toilet paper rolls or a snuffle mat or things like that, that your dog can have fun alone when you are relaxing with that adult beverage, right? Okay. There you have it. All the things you need to know for keeping your dog safe and happy. And the two of you or three of you or five of you, if it's a family vacation, having an amazing time and making memories that you're never going to forget with your dog. If you've ever had a dog or a puppy that has routinely got car sick when you've taken him for trips, uh, you know how heartbreaking that can be. Well, today I've got some help for you because I've been documenting what I have been doing with my puppy who has been getting car sick since she was quite wee. Let's talk car sickness. And so if you have a dog that gets sick in the car, they may throw up. My puppy, this did. They may whine. Yes, she did. They may drool. And that drool is profuse. You may go, how the heck did that actually come out of a puppy? Like it's, they foam. I can actually hear her bubbling. And when you open the mouth, she looks like she's a rabbit dog. She's got foam and bubbles and the drool coats her whole neck and down into her armpits. And she's standing in her crate. Her bed is comfortable completely saturated. How does that much liquid come out of a puppy? And you know, the worst of it all, it's just so heartbreaking. And so what I did early on when this started, I just played around with the crates. My late husband, John, who, you know, he was involved with dogs his entire life. And he used to tell me, Susan, if a dog's upset in the car, just change what they're seeing. So if they're in a wire crate, put them in a, a hard shell crate. So maybe they feel more comfortable, like it's in a den. If they're in a hard shell crate, try them in a wire crate. If they can see the road, maybe it's too much visual stimulation, put them lower in the car where they can't uh, see so much. And I'm taking it for granted your dogs are riding in a crate, right? Please, please, please. All puppies, all dogs. It's just for their own safety. We all know seat belts work for us. Dog crates work for them too. And if you're wondering, traveling in a car, my particular dog crate of choice is the gunner. And so with this, all I needed to do, I had a good friend of mine, John, build a little uh, riser so that this could look out the window while we were driving. And that seemed to take care of things. But then lockdown happened and our city went into complete lockdown in this whole province for um, almost two months. And I just didn't take her anywhere because we were going to uh, puppy gym classes. We were going and all of that just sort of stopped. And so when about three weeks ago, I went to take her in the car again, sure enough, she's a six month old puppy now at that time. And the drool, I actually heard it before I saw it. I backed the car to the garage. And as soon as I stopped, went and put it into forward motion, that change of motion, er, er, I could hear the bubbles 
like, and I, I stopped and I just opened the door and it's just so sad because her little ears go flat. She looks like an earwalk. They just go flat out to the side. And then her eyes are all dilated. And what is that dog experiencing? Any of you who have ever had motion sickness, that's exactly what it is. So whether you get, you've had, you've been seasick on a big boat or a big ship where, whether you've been car sick yourself, it's not just like feeling sick to your stomach. You're completely disoriented. I've had seasickness myself. You don't really know your equ equilibrium is off. And with puppies, what happens is the inner ear is still forming. And so that's why, you know, people say, oh, just wait, they'll outgrow it. And a lot of puppies will outgrow it, but some don't. And I'm going to help you with those ones that don't seem to outgrow it. As the inner ear grows and they get better. So having her get up and be able to look around, maybe that helped. I, I don't know, but I know it stopped pretty much immediately back when I was taking her in the car all the time and it came back and it wasn't going anywhere this time. I tried different crates. It wasn't going to happen. When a dog is doing something they have no control of, you can say, oh, it's okay, honey. Oh, don't worry about it. It makes no difference in the world. I've tried turning on the radio, but you know what? If your car's sick, none of that's going to help. But what happens is if you're always car sick in a car, then as soon as you see the car, you're going to start you know, getting that queasy feeling. And when you get in the car, you're going to go, oh, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. And that is what happens to a lot of puppies who never outgrow that car sick feeling. And on top of that, a lot of times people don't really take their puppies places. They go to the vet to get what? A needle. They get back in the car. They don't go anywhere for a little while. They go to the vet to get what? A booster needle. And they get back in the car. They don't go anywhere. So let me share with you what I did. I'm like, I need to change the CER. I need to change the condition, emotional response to her getting in a car, first of all. And so here's what I did for a week. I backed the car out of the garage and I had it sitting in front of the, of the house and I needed to change the way she got in the car because I drive an SUV and it's a little high off the ground. I would always pick her up and try to put her in. And she was, you know, a little bit unsure because she didn't want to be held up in the air and, and helped into a car. So I became the canine booster seat. And so what I would do is I opened the car door and I sat on the little runner, the, the base of the car door in the car. I sat there kind of working on my squat form and I just encouraged her to jump on my lap and jump in the car. And we just did that for the first day, just jump in the car. And then I would encourage her to jump out of the car on my lap and jump. And I would just give her cookies for in and out, in and out. That was a fun game. She's like, okay, I can do, dig this. Now she's like, okay, I want to get in that car. So instead of being apprehensive about being picked up and put in the car, she's like, I can do this on my own. This is fun. And so for the first week, I would have her jump on my canine booster seat, you know, the human canine booster seat, and she'd get in her crate. I'd close the crate. I'd go sit in the driver's seat. I wouldn't turn on the car. And then I'd say, hey, let's go play Frisbee. And then I'd get her out really quickly. I let her jump down on my lap and then we just go play Frisbee on the lawn. So that happened for the first week. And at the end of the first week, then what I did is for the last day, I turned the car on. And I just sat there, listened to tunes, one tune, and then I get her out. And every time I get her out now, I check her chin. Is there any drool? Because that's where it would happen first. No drool. I would carry on. And so the beginning of the second week, I actually drove down the driveway to the building, which was, you know, maybe a hundred meters. And then I'd get her out. We'd run to the building. We'd play fun games. Of course, I always checked her chin when I got her out and we played fun games. And after playing fun games, we'd get back in the car, drive back up the driveway. I would just back. Actually, I, I turned it around before I got her in the first time, but then she could make a little circle and back up super slow driving up the driveway. So every day since there has been a short car ride. And for the last two weeks or the last week and a half, we've gone to places like we went to PetSmart and walked around PetSmart and got to sniff all kinds of fun things. I've taken her to the grocery store where she actually got her first time, go to some place, sit there, and I would give her cookies. Now that's something I didn't mention. Early on in this process, when she'd get in the car and I'd go to give her a treat, she would not take it. Because she was anticipating what was about to happen and she was getting upset. So she wouldn't eat any cookies. And that's how I knew we were improving because she suddenly started to eat the cookies. 
big celebration. All right. So when I took her this trip last week was to the grocery store, which is probably about 5k away. So I got her to the grocery store. I got out, I gave her cookies. She took it. And that's like one of the great things about the gunners is I can feed the cookies really super easy. And then I closed the door. I walked as if I was going to the grocery store. And then I circled back behind a few cars, opened the car door, gave her cookie. She's still okay. She's still good. So then I walked into the grocery store. I didn't buy it. I just bought a couple of things like cilantro and avocados. Got back in the car, gave her cookie, still no drool. Yes, got home, played from Frisbee. Boom, chakalaka, we are on a good path. My dog's life, I am overtly cautious about. I take minimal risks and I take zero uncalculated risks. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about today because I see people taking crazy risks. And I think, do they not realize the chances they're taking with their dog? I've narrowed it down to eight different ways that people drive with their dogs in a car. And for me, there's only two that should ever be considered. And for me, there's only ever one that I would do. The number eight way, let's start right at the bottom and go all the way up. Can you guess what is the way that is a crazy risk to your dog that people use as a mode of transportation for their dog. And I'm going to tell you most recent statistics, this was from 2021. And this is not even like, they can't really get full documentation of this is the minimal amount of dogs killed per year is 100,000 dogs a year die traveling this way. 100,000 in the United States alone. Are you kidding me? 100,000 dogs a year die traveling in the back of a pickup truck. That's not even including all the ones that get injured. The number seven way is a dog traveling down the road with their head hanging out the window because easily, easily you take a swerve, that dog's falling and they're out on the road. The dog's got their head out the window and you're traveling at least 30 miles an hour, 50 kilometers an hour, let's say moderate, but I've seen dogs going down the highway like this. One little bug, let alone a stone flying up. Have you ever had a stone hit your, your windscreen? Hmm. How do you think that's going to work out in your dog's eye? Why? Why take that risk? The next three are kind of related. And that would be a dog traveling on your lap. Come on guys, a dog traveling on your lap. Can you say airbags. Airbags and a little dog on your lap or a big dog on your lap, that's not boding well for the dog or for you, my friend. They don't belong on your lap. They don't belong hanging out a window. The number five, anywhere on your front seat. A dog does not belong out on the front seat. Actually, I don't believe dogs belong loose anywhere in the car. And there's a lot of statistics that agree with me. Do you know that you are twice as likely to have a car accident with a dog loose in your car. Some states in the United States actually will fine you if your dog is riding loose in the car, anywhere loose in the car. It's predicted that 10,000 accidents a year happen because of a dog loose in a car. Never would I take a risk with my dog's life. Dogs should not be riding loose in anybody's car. Now you can say, well, my dog rides loose in the back seat. There's still a projectile. So that's my number four, not a great place for a dog is riding loose in the back seat because not only are, is it a danger to the dog, you just tap the brakes and they can go through the windscreen. You just tap the brakes. And even if they just slam against the back of your seat, they could really seriously get hurt. But let alone that, The dog in the back seat that's loose gets the chance to obsess about what's out the window, going back and forth, creating anxiety for themselves, creating barrier frustration, potentially turning into aggression. Why? Why, I ask? Okay. The number three way to travel in a car is behind a barred barrier. So you see there's barred barriers. They give the, the dogs the whole back area, and that at least keeps the people safe in front, but you still have your dog projectiling around that back seat where there's potentially windows that they can go out of, bars that they can get hit by. I mean, it's just, again, is a danger. Now we're going to the number two way a dog can ride in a car. And this one, 
so much safer than the six I just mentioned. And that would be seat belting your dog in the back seat. But I'm going to put an asterisk on this one because you have to investigate the seat belts that are approved. So you've heard me mention on this podcast before, the Center for Pet Safety, that they do tests on pet carriers, on seat belts, and on dog crates. My number one way that I want my dogs to travel, and it really, I can't remember a time my dogs haven't traveled this way, and that is having my dogs travel in a crate. And not just any crate. I like to have my dogs in a gunner crate. Now I recognize it's the Cadillac of dog crates. It's heavy. I like it because it's got metal bars built into the crate that you can anchor the crate down. So a dog crate in itself doesn't mean it's necessarily safer than say a harness because there's a lot of flimsy dog crates and those flimsy dog crates can become projectiles on their own. So you'll see some flimsy dog crates that have tie downs. Now tie downs to me are very different than anchoring a crate, right? Doesn't even sound a little more flimsy, right? I tied down my crate versus I anchored my crate. So when I anchor my dog crates when in the car, I use the really hefty nylon strapping with the, the clamps that bite into the nylon that are secure, that are not going to move. And I anchor that to the car frame. So there's, there's a lot of pieces in your car frame that has hooks actually for anchoring cargo in your car. Now, not all cars have them, but a lot of them do, especially the vans. So I anchor my dog's crates to the car frame. Another thing that I do, the back of your car and the back of a van, for those of us who have dog vehicles, the back of an SUV or the back of a van is what's called a crumple zone. The crumple zone is a part of the car that's intended to collapse. It's intended to crash. It's intended to accordion for your safety. But unfortunately, that's a part of the car where people put their dogs. So, When I'm anchoring my dogs down, I do not anchor them anywhere near the crumple zone. I always move them forward and I put my luggage and anything else I'm carrying with me behind my dog crates. So really secure crates, anchor them to the frame of your car and keep them out of the crumple zone. Now, I recognize you can't all run out and get gunners, but on the Center for Pet Safety, they have other dog crates that really pass some tests. And there are some others that aren't in the pet safety, but I've seen safety data on crates like the rough, tough crates. They do really, really well in crash test safety. Don't just tie them down with a bungee because then, you know, they're not secure in an accident. They are flying all over. A crate that's anchored is safe. I think a harness that safety approved is second best. A flimsy wire crate, not a good idea. It could collapse. It becomes a skewer. It can skewer. Let's let, you know what? Let's not even go there with our imagination. Okay. So a secure dog crate, best way to travel. I recognize that maybe you need a different kind of car. I recognize that if that's not possible, get yourself a dog harness. All right. So think about the risks you're taking in your life and ask yourself, should I be including the risk of my dog's life? I certainly hope not. 